Jesus is God, Jesus is Lord, Jesus has the victory. We all have a call, a call to greatness, a desire for it. We want to do something good. Now is your time. You could change the world, and the world needs changing. So get busy. Shalom World, God's own channel. In the Eastern Christian theology, there underlies a word called theosis, meaning being in union with God. Theosis is achieved through purification of mind and body, called catharsis. After my visit to the Byzantine Catholic Church of Annunciation in Homer Glen, Illinois, I became engrossed with the Eastern Rite. Father Thomas Loya's introduction to the Byzantine Rite encouraged me to read more about the unique characteristics of Eastern Christianity. I started reading The Way of a Pilgrim, the inspiring Russian work that recounts the writer's journey across Russia practicing the Jesus Prayer. I also read about the monasteries of Mount Athos in Greece and Valam in Russia. As I bid farewell to Father Thomas Loya, he told me about a Byzantine monastery called Holy Resurrection in St. Nazian's, Wisconsin, and instantly I felt it calling my name. My name is Anna Nuzzo. I'm a contemporary Christian singer and songwriter. I've performed in many countries across the world. Everything I have is a gift, a gift from the Most High. And so at a certain point in my life, I decided I would devote my music for Him and for Him alone. It was a long drive from my home to St. Nazian's, Wisconsin, the village where the monastery is situated. Established in 1854 as a religious colony of German immigrants under Father Ambrose Ashwald, the village's name itself reminded me of Nazareth from the scriptures. Far away from the maddening crowd, from the parameters of time management, I felt I was somewhere in southeastern Europe, the ancestral home of the Eastern Orthodox Church, after Greece and Egypt. The monks received me with great joy. They receive everyone the same way. One of the principal aspects of monastic life is to receive a guest as Jesus would. The abbot of the community, Father Nicholas, was outside, seated and contemplating. Holy Resurrection Monastery is a reflection of Abbot Nicholas's background. He was born to Greek parents, a Roman Catholic mother and a Greek Orthodox father in Egypt. When the young Nicholas was six, their family left for Australia. And now, for the past 26 years, he's been in the United States. Abbot Nicholas's thoughts soon began to spring to life with a timely apostolic exhortation St. John Paul II wrote, Orientale Lumen. It was a call to all Catholics to understand the greatness of Eastern traditions of the Church. The Pope wrote, We believe that the venerable and ancient tradition of the Eastern Churches is an integral part of the heritage of Christ's Church. The first need for Catholics is to be familiar with that tradition, so as to be nourished by it, and to encourage the process of unity in the best way possible for each. Abbot Nicholas spoke and so, to me. Uh, Holy Resurrection Monastery is an attempt to establish something to have a home for me. But it also happened at a time when Pope John Paul the Great, 
Pope John Paul II wrote Oriental Illumin in 1995, where he encouraged Eastern Catholics to go back to their own identity rather than be too influenced by the Latin Church because mm -hmm. their heritage, just because they're smaller, their heritage is just as rich, just as old, just as valuable. Mm -hmm. And so he encouraged us to reclaim our identity and part of that identity is the monastic or the spirituality. You can't have an apostolic church with a spirituality without monasticism. It's the same thing. And so uh, Holy Resurrection Monastery is an attempt to take Oriental Lumen, the apostolic exhortation of John Paul II, seriously and to implement it by reviving the identity of the Greek Catholic churches, both in their home countries and the diaspora like America, the New World, and in an in a attempt to them to discover their identity more fully through monasticism, which is part mm -hmm. of their identity, and by doing that, to encourage Roman Catholics to rediscover their identity, mm. which a lot has been lost uh, since Vatican II. Yes, Vatican II had to happen. A lot of good things happened. But I think a lot of things were given up that were not thought through. And so uh, we need renewal. We need to face, to read the signs of the times. But we also need to be the apostolic Catholic Church too. And I think uh, Roman Catholics, by seeing what we're doing, by rubbing shoulders with us can better rediscover their own Roman Catholic mm. identity. Prayer is an integral part of the monastic community of Holy Resurrection. The monks pray always. When they're not in church, they pray the Jesus prayer in their hearts, which is the focal point of the Eastern Christianity. The Jesus prayer is simply, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. In the Gospels, we hear that uh, that's the prayer of the, uh, the public, and the Pharisee uh, exalts himself, says how great he is, and we hear that he goes home condemned. The uh, publican knows his unworthiness, so he's very humble. And our Lord says he comes home justified. And that's what his prayer is. He's humble before the Lord. And so from that, the early Desert Fathers took the scriptural prayer and repeated it uh, 10 times, 20 times, 100 times, 1,000 times, because that was the prayer that made them go home justified. Of course, we're talking about the early church when most people couldn't read or write or read. And so mm -hmm. the early desert fathers and mothers, the Amas and the Abbas, couldn't read or write. So they had to learn off by heart. So it was a very simple prayer mm -hmm. that was very, very deep. It was ideal for them. And it can be for us because a simple prayer, we're educated, but for us it's a simple prayer. It's a prayer that can focus us. It's a prayer that we can use like as, as a white noise to distract us from the the many distractions around us, noise, uh, the busy world we live in, uh, worries, anxieties, it can be used like a white noise. In that sense it's a contemplative prayer, not a meditative prayer like the rosary. So it can distract us from the distractions so that we can more intimately listen to the voice of God. There are about nine monks living at Holy Resurrection Monastery. Archimandrite Nicholas, who is the abbot, Father Maximus, the Protos and Treasurer, Hierodeacon Moses, who's the chef, Father Basil, the monastic handyman, Father Paesi, the guest in charge, and brothers Isaac, Zorge, Demetrios, and Anthony. Anthony is the Benjamin of the group, as he joined the monastery a little over a year ago. Vocation to live monastic life for each one of these monks was different. Father Maximus was an attorney in Australia. His decision to take Christ seriously happened while vacationing in Egypt. I had an experience, a couple of experiences on a long backpack trip that I took between finishing college and beginning to work. I was an attorney, um, did, went to law school in Sydney. And before I started work, I went to, uh, uh, first of all, the, Egypt was the first country. And I was in the southern city of Aswan, and I treated myself to a hotel room. It was very, very inexpensive. And this hotel had three stories and, and an elevator. And the elevator was very, very old, and it took a long time to get, to actually have a conversation but from, uh, as it went from floor to floor. And there was this, uh, they had an elevator attendant this young kid must have been about 16 years old. 
and he had an, a uniform, which was about three sizes too big for him. His sleeves came down to here. And, and uh, the, the, the last day of my, my stay there, I was uh, in the elevator and he was pressing the button that took me to, to my floor. And I could see him looking at me as though he wanted to talk to me. And all I assumed he wanted was a tip, a bakshish, so they say. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got ready to get some money out of my pocket. And all he said to me was, are you a Christian? And for me, that was a real question at the time. Am I a Christian? But I knew enough, because I knew the reason I was in Egypt was because I loved history. And I knew enough about the history of the church in Egypt, especially that of the, the Coptic Orthodox Church in Egypt, to know that for him to ask that question was a life and death issue. Are you a Christian? And so I knew that he, he deserved an answer. And so I said, yes. And he just pulled his sleeve back and there was a little cross, a little blue cross tattooed on his wrist. And he said, so am I. That's all. Just so am I. And the, uh, the elevator door opened and I went out and I left the elevator a Christian. That's all I can say. And that was, that was Egypt. Uh, then there were some other experiences that uh, took me to the island of Patmos in uh, the Greek island of Patmos, where St. John the Evangelist wrote the Apocalypse, the Revelation. And that was also an extraordinary event uh, in my life. I had a, an experience of the presence of God in that place that uh, set me on the path. Really, that set me on the path to monasticism. So if I'm a Christian because of Egypt, I'm a monk perhaps because of Greece. Um, now, of course, I didn't know exactly where that would take me at the time. Um, but I'd always, really it was, it was the rebirth of an idea that had been with me a long time. I'd always wanted, actually in many ways, I'd always wanted to be a monk. Um, because I'd always loved prayer. Uh, even, as, even as a, quote, atheist, unquote, um, I loved to sit by myself and read. I loved that solitary uh, communing with thought that I, I now identify as prayer. Former rapper, Brother Isaac, challenged Christ, and now, 15 years later, he's a monk who recites the holy name of Jesus second after second, minute after minute. It's one of those things, like, I never expected it. Okay. Um, I actually, one of the things I love, the part of the story that I love is, I remember when I'd been away from the church. So, I, you know, I was away from the church, and I visited my sisters who were at a, a Benedictine college. And I remember, like, our whole family was there. And I remember I actually turned to them and said, you know, if I believed in this Jesus, I'd be a monk. You know, so it was like, you know, now I look back and think it's funny, but, you know, so it's, it's like there was something there even from that time. When was that? Um, oh How gosh, many years ago, would you say? Maybe 15? Wow. Yeah, maybe 15 years ago or okay. so. Okay, okay. Um, and then, you know, as kind of things happened, I was living in Connecticut at the time. And I was doing uh, actually hip hop production and hip hop music. Really? And, yeah, pe people don't expect that. Uh, that's okay. one of those strange things. Um, Were you singing or? Yeah, I, I was. I was making beats and I was rapping. So. Okay. Um, and I had a group, and you know, I got kind of got to the point where it was, you know, I was basically living in the studio, and it was, you know, you're eating ramen noodles every few days, and <laughs> and one of the one of the guys in my group was actually dating an Orthodox Jewish girl. And she would bring over, you know, like the Torah and some of the, the texts. And, and we'd like, you know, we'd talk about it a little bit. So I started reading the Torah and the Old Testament and all that. And then I remember I finally just gave up. Like, power was out, no food. Like, it was just kind of, I can remember, you know, I just gave up. I was sitting on the floor and I was just like, you know, it was one of those actual moments where you see in the movies or something where you're like, God, if you exist, like, I'm giving up, like, and the next thing I know, God exists. Um, and I was, I was lucky enough to, to humble myself and call my parents and say, you know, I need some help. I don't know really what I'm doing. Um, but they allowed me to come back to Indianapolis, which is where they were living. And the, the stipulation was, but you have to go to school. And I thought, you know, that's fine. I'll go back to school. This is a great opportunity. So I did. I went back to school and 
I actually started majoring in theology at a Catholic university before I had even come back to the church. So it's, it's just full of like strange, uh, strange things. Father Moses has fed the community for a very long time as he is the chef, a professional chef. Father Moses is a senior member of the community. He also appears on a television show about cooking, which is watched by many people. Brother Moses, um, so I hear you're a professional chef. Yes, before coming to the monastery, I was a professional chef. Worked in the hotel and restaurant uh, industry for years. I was a chef on a private yacht in Greece for uh, some time. Wow. And now I cook here. <laughs> They're lucky to have you, aren't they? <laughs> I don't know. What a blessing. <laughs> oh, you don't know. <laughs> so can you tell me what a typical day is like for you here? Um, a typical day, we, we spend about five or six hours a day in liturgical prayer. Mm -hmm. we, uh, we pray individually in our cells as well. And my work revolves around the kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, so I prepare the meals for the, the monks and whatever guests we have. We often have groups come in, so we'll prepare a meal for them. I heard you have a cooking show. Yes, uh, Mother Gabriella and I, Mother Gabriella is from Christ the Bridegroom Monastery in Ohio. We do a, a cooking show. It's called Eastern Hospitality. And right now, it's, it's available online, easternhospitality.org. And we incorporate um, feasting and fasting foods and talk about uh, the spirituality of food and um, hospitality just in our day-to-day -day lives as Christians. So. I also heard that there are little cooking retreats that you have periodically. Yep. Here at the monastery, um, a couple times a year, we offer a cooking retreat where people will come and we'll sit and we'll talk about the spirituality of food, they'll participate in the life of the monastery, and we'll come in the kitchen and cook. Can you compare how the monastery was in the beginning, because you were one of the originals, mm -hmm. and how it is now? <laughs> um, <laughs> things were very rough in the beginning. When we started out in the desert, we had no money. <laughs> um, our living conditions were very basic. Um, and then over the, the last 22 years, we, we've really grown. Um, for a good long time, there were just the, the four of us, um, Father Nicholas, Father Maximus, Father Basil, and myself. And now we've, we've grown to, to uh, 10 members of the community. We've um, relocated to a much more hospitable part of the country. And we have a much nicer facility, a, a much nicer church to pray in, much nicer building to live in. So we've seen a lot of uh, spiritual growth as well as physical growth in the community over the last 22 years. I attended the service with monks and it was so divine. The monks who I saw outside were all active, running around, fulfilling their duties. But once inside the church, they all looked like angels. I was reminded of Ostrov, a Russian biographical film directed by internationally acclaimed director Pavel Lunging about a fictional 20th century Eastern Orthodox monk and monastery. In each of the monks at Holy Resurrection Monastery, I could see Pavel's protagonist, Father Anatoly. Again, we pray for our brethren in Christ and for all Orthodox Christians. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Father, now and ever and unto the ages of ages. Abbot Nicholas, the top man, or the head of the monastery, was so devoted to his mission that I couldn't take my eyes off his face which was so filled with grace. I asked him why he named the monastery Holy Resurrection. 
Well, the resurrection, of course, is the central element of our faith. If Christ, as St. Paul said, didn't rise from the dead, then we'd be wasting our time here <laughs> and having a monastery. And the early church knew that. So the early monastics, in fact, didn't live in the desert, but they lived around the tomb of Jesus where the resurrection took place, the first anchorites and anchoresses and hermits. So really, now later when the empire became Christian, uh, then the faith became much more worldly and the monks and the nuns wanted to go in the desert where they couldn't be contaminated. But originally it wasn't the case. The Church of the Resurrection, as called the Church of the Sepulchre, was built where the tomb of our Lord was, where the early monastics uh, began to inhabit and live their faith, to be close to where Jesus was in his earthly life, at, uh, to be close to the event of the most significant event of human history, the Resurrection. Not every monk is a priest in the monastery. Priesthood in Byzantine monastic life is created only based on need. Brother Sorge so explained this to me. Whenever you join the monastery to be a monk, you're joining to be a monk for the rest of your life. So monks typically aren't, aren't clerical. Uh, we're currently somewhat lay people. So we don't join to become priests. Um, so, but obviously there are priests in the, in, in the monastery. Uh, they're called Tyro monks. And what happens is the, the abbot chooses from amongst the community when the need for a priest arises, the abbot chooses somebody to be ordained a priest to, to serve the needs of the, of the community. So priests are only ordained in the community as, as they're needed. So typically most of us will, 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 will be monks and, um, and there'll be some who are, who, who are priests and, and, and some who are deacons. Uh, so the way typically formation works in, in the Byzantine church, there's some variations, um, like Mount Athos is kind of the center of, of Eastern monasticism. Um, but in this monastery, we join for an extended period for an observership, uh, which can last between six months to, to a year, um, so that you can really see the way of life, how the monastery operates, what the the, the monastic rhythm is, especially the, the, the rhythm of prayer that underpins our entire life. And after the observership, uh, if it mutually, if the community and, 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 and the candidate um, feel that, that, he, that he has a monastic vocation, he'll join as a postulant, again for six months to a year. And then after that period, um, then the abbot tonsures um, the candidate a, a monk what's called a rasiform monk. So it's kind of this first profession, but, but still a novice. Uh, and that lasts for three to six years as a, as a rasiform monk. After that period, then, you uh, are tonsured a stavrofor monk, which means it's Greek for, for cross bearer, and rasiform means robe bearer. So when you become a stavrofor monk, um, that's when you make solemn profession the commitment for life. I have been to several monasteries and convents. I've never seen any community lead a life like the monks of Holy Resurrection Monastery. Right from Abbot Nicholas to the young novice Anthony, the monks have embraced simplicity as their tool to lead a contemplative life. The monks lead a very simple life from a materialistic Nine. perspective, and they have no complaints about it either. Their slightly worn clothes and poverty does not pull them away from their spiritual life. They have made their lack of resources their strength. They are in fact very rich in their spiritual life. Instead of living a possible life of greater comfort or even luxury, these men have chosen to lead their lives like this. Why? Pope John Paul, in his apostolic letter, Orator Lumen, said a very good thing. He said, in the, in the Eastern churches, monastic life is the reference point for all Christians. It's the reference point for all the baptized. It's the reference point for the priesthood of all believers. Monks and nuns are not priests. They are lay people. The, and so lay people and monastics are only different to the degree that they pray. They're not different in essence. So monasteries are important because they are 
as Pope John Paul said, a reference point like a mirror where lay people can not just hear about the Word of God, not just hear the evangelization, not just hear the rules, but actually see it uh, being lived in a monastery. And of course, if they're married with children and responsibilities and jobs, they can't live the monastic life fully, but they can live it to some degree in their own way of life. And I think this is the importance of monasteries being uh, reference points. People can see it, how it is in its intense form, and live it to some degree. We have a lot of families around that come to the monastery and they know when the monks pray, when the monks fast, and they follow it in their homes, not to the same degree, in a modified mm -hmm. form. They come to church, again, not to all the services, but to some. So they live partly monastic lives. And that's what monastic life is, the life of baptism. It's, it's the Christian life. That's all it is. And so I think it's an example, it's an aid to people to see the Christian life lived uh, flesh and bones, not just heard about, not just read about, but actually seeing the reality. And then, of course, people have to adapt it to their own real life in the world. I think this is the gift that monastic life has to give to all people. In Orientale Lumen, Pope John Paul II writes, The monastery is the prophetic place where creation becomes praise of God and the precept of concretely lived charity becomes the ideal of human coexistence. It is where the human being seeks God without limitation or impediment, becoming a reference point for all people, bearing them in his heart and helping them to seek God. The monks of Holy Resurrection try to achieve the same goal. The community's aim is to seek God without limitation, and they are progressing. Everything else is secondary to them. Although the vocations are few, the monks are praying unceasingly for more monks. Without monasticism, the church is incomplete. I spoke to Brother Anthony, a young American who joined the monastery last year. God is at the center. Um, God is in the heart, you know, of the Eucharist that we share with um, each week. And uh, in order to be able to have that, uh, to grow in love in the sacraments towards our brothers and towards members outside of the community, um, that's what's important, you know. Uh, Christ called us, God calls us, He says, you know, Love God um, with all your heart, soul, mind, and body. And the second is, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, so right. to be able to daily struggle with that and put that into practice um, through prayer uh, is definitely no small feat. Um, mm -hmm. But I know that God is here with us. Um, and when we open our hearts and love towards each other, um, uh, miracles do happen, I believe. Uh, and uh, we definitely have a brotherly love and affection for each other um, because our lives are focused on the sacraments and on Christ. By the end of my visit, I had learned to understand the biggest of all graces, to be grateful to the Divine Master for everything He has blessed me with. The monks taught me the importance of being grateful to God. With the abbot's blessings, and great memories of my two-day visit to the Holy Resurrection Monastery, I bid farewell to my world as a changed person. Bishop Daniel Flores from the Diocese of Brownsville. It's my pleasure to greet all of our viewers, Shalom World TV. I pray that the programming that Shalom offers is a help to your faith, hope, and love. May God continue to bless you through the prayers of the Blessed Virgin Mary and Saint Joseph, that your faith might lead you to a deeper, more intimate knowledge of the goodness of God in your life. May God bless and protect you always, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Shalom World, God's own channel.